Google has thrown their quantum junk on the table and told everyone to measure up, claiming complete quantum supremacy. And IBM's like, I don't see it. And according to quantum theory, nothing exists until it's observed. Because IBM wants to observe themselves being quantum supreme. They think they're the ultimate quantum hype beast and they don't want to be quantum AND when they could be quantum Intel. If you don't know a lot about quantum physics, this is a great video because if my dumb ass can understand it well enough to crack jokes, how hard can it be? Really hard actually. It took me a long time to not understand this and I'm changed. And after watching this, you'll be able to talk confidently about quantum physics in any setting. I'm just kidding, don't try that. That will not work out well. Just send them the link to this video. With trillions of dollars on the line, this is potentially the most expensive beef of all time. Google's announcement marks the beginning of a race that's about to heat up a lot in the next few years. And it's pretty crazy that Google just went for it and jumped the gun with the claim. I mean, they must be thinking that this is the knee of the car. Welcome to Knee of the Curve, I'm Emmett Short. Don't get left in the past, hit subscribe for more of the world's nerdiest dick jokes. If I make you laugh or you learn a little something or both and you feel like supporting the show, I put together some merch on Teespring and you can check out the description for links to Patreon, PayPal, crypto, or just share this with someone you think will like it. I asked people on the street what they thought about quantum supremacy and <laughs> what it was, and the answers were pretty hilarious. That'll be a separate video this week, and if you're watching this before I've uploaded it, just know when it's done, it will be linked right up here. Let's get right to it, quantum supremacy. Some people I asked thought it was the title of Kevin Hart's new stand-up special. It makes sense, you know, because he's small and very powerful. Or a new Quantum Leap movie where Sam Beckett jumps inside the body of Hitler and just decides to go with it when it's actually the harnessing of subatomic particles ability to be two things simultaneously in order to make a computer that can do calculations in seconds that take today's fastest supercomputers thousands of years. Crazy, right? Because the first two seem way more plausible. Quantum supremacy is like when your girlfriend asks, do you notice anything different about me? And it would take you, the classical computer, 10,000 years to figure out how to not ruin her day. But her best friend Jeffrey, who's bi, can see instantly she's just wearing a slightly darker shade of eyeshadow. Because just like a quantum computer, Jeffrey's bits go either way, or both ways at the same time. So he sees everything and therefore knows the answer instantly. Am I the first person to compare quantum computing to bisexuality? Do I get a prize? All right, I'm alone in my bedroom. Anyway. This announcement is really exciting for physicists because quantum computers could help them figure out a unified theory of the universe, which has actually been advancing at a frustratingly slow pace. It's been a bit of a disappointment for theoretical physicists who hoped that they would be living through a golden age of theoretical physics rather than the mathematics of theoretical physics. The idea that we would have had perhaps two generations of physicists who can't make contact with experimental reality uh, is completely unprecedented in the modern era. This is very uh, interesting and rather disturbing. Ugh, kids today, am I right? They can't even solve quantum gravity. But IBM senior manager of quantum research, Dr. Talia Gershon, is not giving up hope. Here she is explaining quantum mechanics to children. Quantum mechanics is a branch of science. It's the study of things that are either really, really small, really, really well isolated, or really, really cold. Really small, isolated, and cold. That's literally the perfect setup for a dick joke, but I'm gonna keep it classy this time. The fact is, quantum physicist bits are so small. How small are they? They behave like a particle in a wave. <laughs> no, not their bits, their bits. Like ones and zeros. If you've watched any of these other quantum supremacy videos, they tell you. Bits are a classical computer's building blocks. Individual data units represented as a zero or a one, but a quantum computer is different. Regular computers process data as binary bits, represented either as a one or a zero. A quantum computer's equivalent data is known as quantum bits or qubits, which can exist in both zero and one states at once. While classical computers use bits, ones and zeros, Qubits 
can be one and zero at the same time. But they don't tell you why. Why are bits only ones and zeros? They think you're smart enough to know that. Well, not me. I mean, if computer code is based on ones and zeros, and that's the big bottleneck, how about you throw a fucking two in there? Maybe a three, just spitballing. Wouldn't it be great if I was right and every quantum physicist who watches this, their brain just explodes? I'm crowned king of computing and there's a law named after me. I will get a law one day. But no, there are only ones and zeros because the simplest form of a digital circuit that can be represented in a computer's hardware called a logic gate is bound by the laws of physics to be either on or off. There are only two possibilities in the hardware. So the corresponding software representation of that is either a one or a zero. This is normal for us. Our intuition of physics has been built up in a way that ignores how the quantum universe operates. But as we've learned in the quantum universe, particles do also exist as waves. We actually have photographic proof. In 2015, a Swiss research team managed to take a photo of light. Wait, that's not impressive. All photos are of light, but this photo shows light behaving as a particle and a wave. Yep, that's what that is, a probability wave. And just like my freestyle flows, the mere act of observing it collapses it. It's impossible to convince someone you can freestyle without rhyming. It's a catch-22. If you don't freestyle in front of them, it's proof you can't freestyle. If you freestyle in front of them, it's proof you can't freestyle. So these days I just keep it in my car alone. But it's the act of observing a quantum wave that makes it become a particle. It's like your high school friend's girlfriend from two towns over. She literally did not exist until she walked into prom. Quantum computer circuits use that weirdness to do some awesome things. Instead of using a gate that is either open or closed, they use quantum bits or qubits, tiny spinning particles, so small, isolated, and cold that they can be both a one and a zero at the same time. It's called superposition, and it's the reverse cowgirl of computation. It's better than that, actually. Imagine reverse cowgirl, but She's got tits on her back. It's, it's mind blowing, it defies the laws of nature, and if you question it, you realize now you've got tits on your back, there's eight tits and climbing, and because in the quantum realm, everything that's possible is happening in some dimension, and the less you think about it and just go with it, the faster you're gonna get where you're going. So these qubits and their superpositions make it possible to do calculations with an extra option, a one or a zero or both. Plus, they're linked to their neighbors by what's called entanglement. Here's physicist and quantum John Travolta, Andre Morello for more. To really understand what is special about quantum bits and why they can provide such a large computational power, we need to look at what happens when we take more than one qubit. The resulting state is a superposition of 0, 1 and 1, 0. This is called an entangled state. If I separate the two spins and I measure, for example, spin A and I find it in the 0 state, then instantly spin B acquires the one state, no matter how far apart it is when the measurement takes place. This is what Einstein called dismissively the spooky action at a distance, but now we know from many experimental tests that this is the way quantum mechanics really works. That shirt's given off a lot of spooky action at a distance in the form of nausea. This guy actually inspired me to develop a dating app for quantum physicists based on the concept of spooky action at a distance called SAD. It's an app where you can date someone while simultaneously not dating them. Yeah, that's right. It's exactly like every other dating app. But quantum Billy Bob Thornton is right. As the entangled particles do their calculations, their answers are having a direct effect on their entangled neighbors. It's like if you're taking a test and every time your neighbor gets an answer right, it's also right on your paper. So you can move on to the next problem. And when you get one right, your neighbor instantly has the answer. So you're both gonna finish that test way faster. And the more qubits you add, the effect grows exponentially. So a machine with a thousand qubits could predict exactly where a hurricane will hit before it even forms, or simulate molecules to create wonder drugs that cure aging, or figure out why we need a matrix four. Why? It makes no sense to have a fourth matrix. Neo's dead. Trinity's dead. The only way this is going to be cool is if it turns out the new Neo is John Wick. The burning questions of the ages could be a decade away from being answered, especially if you think about it in terms of exponentials. 
For example, one of the first things quantum computers will be able to help us understand is how the hell quantum computers work and how to engineer materials that will make them work way better, which is why everybody's working on this problem. Everybody's involved. Microsoft, Google, all of them are rushing in to learn the quantum mechanics of atoms because we're going to be computing on individual atoms. The main problem they're having is as you add more qubits, it gets harder and harder to do error correction, which is important. I mean, great job, Google. Your quantum computer gave you an answer. Guess we'll see if it's right in about 10,000 years. Without error correction, that's what we're looking at. The fact is, these qubits are incredibly fragile. They get triggered by the simplest things. We're all living in 2019. We know how annoying that is. I'm not pointing any fingers. I know how you hate that. But it's why these quantum computers are encased in steel drums and chilled down to colder than space. It's why they've all been stuck at a low number of qubits. The company that solves error correction is going to win the race to quantum supremacy and get the girl. They're very motivated. This is where the Google IBM beef starts to heat up. See, Google said their Sycamore chip performed a calculation in 200 seconds that Summit, currently the world's fastest supercomputer, would take 10,000 years to do. Mic drop. IBM pulls a mic out of their back pocket. They're like, quit lying. Summit can theoretically do that calculation in two and a half days. Google snatches the mic and goes, 200 seconds, yo and drops the mic again. IBM catches the mic and says, look, the idea of quantum supremacy is doing something that would take a classical computer an impractically long time. And while waiting two and a half days might seem like a long time to you toddlers at Google, it's not impractical. Especially when the answer could be way more precise. And then IBM drops the mic and kicks it and Google's like, oh, psh, okay, boomer. But IBM has a point. Google is not quantum supreme. They're quantum pretty good. It's quantum participation. You can get a quantum gold star. They must have used the same PR firm that told AT&T to just go ahead and use that 5G logo. No one will know. Throw an E on the end. People will think they have 5G. You don't. It's still 4G. So IBM says the race is still on, and there's a lot of other companies like Microsoft who's been working on this topological quibit they say is almost ready to unveil. What I like about the Google announcement is it's gotten everyone talking, everyone's talking about their new tech and it's about to pop. It just feels like the competition's heating up and there's gonna be an explosion of breakthroughs coming from all these different companies. It just marks the beginning of like a really exciting time bringing the promise of wonder drugs, better batteries, teleportation, broccoli that tastes good, and booze that's good for you. It's also gonna solve tough logistical problems, so companies like Amazon can make more money. Thank God. Maybe then they'll pay some taxes. These quantum computers are one of the key factors in bringing about the fabled technological singularity. You just watched an entire video on quantum supremacy, so I'm assuming you're familiar with the singularity. If not, there's a video linked right up here you can click on to find out how crazy that's gonna be. And tell me in the comments what you think about quantum computing. I asked a bunch of people on Hollywood Boulevard what they knew about it, and the answers were pretty hilarious. If you wanna see how you stack up against the average Joe, when I finish editing that, I will put it right here. Definitely watch that. Huge thanks, as always, to my Patreon supporters. If you like technology news, think about subscribing or joining these awesome people as a patron. If you'd like to write jokes or help research for this series, hit me up on Twitter or join my Discord server, links in description, or just click on one of these other videos to stay up to date on how technology is changing everything. Peace.